Good morning once again, everyone. Maybe just a couple of um, housekeeping rules as we uh, start our Twitter spaces. Um, as you know, uh, only the speakers and the host are able to use their microphones, uh, while all the other um, users that join are going to uh, join in listening mode. And afterwards, uh, when we go through the Q&A, if you have any questions for the speakers, we invite you to uh, use the hashtag ask home and tweet your questions. Um, and of course, uh, if, if there is time, perhaps we can also um, hear from some questions in the public. Um, as an audience member, you may request the permission to speak. Um, but from past experiences, um, we do encourage you to, to tweet your questions via uh, the hashtag um, ask home. All right. So now it's uh, 9.30 and we can uh, officially start. In principle, we're also trying to record uh, the Twitter Spaces, it's a, it's a new feature from uh, the Twitter Spaces app. Um, if uh, this does work as we're intending to, you will be able to listen in playback mode um, afterwards, up to 30 days. This housekeeping uh, being said, uh, once again, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third Twitter Spaces from the EU Commission, uh, Directorate General Migration and Home Affairs, DG Home, uh, EU Home Affairs. I'm Ferreira Belchu from the Communications Unit here at Digi Home, and I'll be the moderator of today's discussion. Um, after our second Twitter Spaces in October, we asked you in a poll to let us know which topics uh, from the home policy areas you would like to hear about next. And actually, Schengen was at the top of your preferences. So here we are today, bringing you a, a multi-EU perspective from our speakers. We have here with us um, at Digi Home and in front of me, our Deputy Director General, Olivia Nidi from the European Commission Director General, uh, Director General for Migration and Home Affairs. We have uh, Tanya Fayon, member of the European Parliament from Slovenia. She is the chair of the Special Schengen Scrutiny Working Group mm -hmm. and the European Parliament Rapporteur for the 2017 Schengen Border Code Revision. And last but not least, we also have with us this morning, Pierre Renaud de la Motte. He's the head of the Justice and Home Affairs Department at the French Permanent Representation to the EU. Welcome everyone once again. So let's start this conversation here at home, addressing our uh, Deputy Director General, Olivia Nidi. What does Schengen represent for the European Union and its citizens? And what are the main benefits for citizens living in the Schengen area? The floor is yours. Well, good morning to uh, everyone. Thank you very much actually for choosing this, uh, this subject. It's, uh, it's a very, very good, uh, good choice. For some, uh, probably Schengen is uh, the most uh, uh, visible uh, face of uh, what the European Union uh, represents. And for others, that's probably the most invisible face. Uh, uh, the most visible face probably for people of my generation, because we've seen over the years we've encountered uh, what border controls, border checks uh, uh, were actually meaning when we moved from one country to the other. Everything was very complicated. Uh, uh, we lost a lot of time at uh, uh, borders and all this disappeared. And for many younger generation, uh, users of, uh, of Twitter, uh, this uh, is, uh, uh, of course, uh, something uh, uh, of uh, the normal. Uh, Schengen has always been there, and uh, uh, they actually discover the beauty of Schengen when uh, uh, we are facing a challenge, a problem, a crisis. And all of a sudden, we see what actually Schengen represents uh, when faced with situations like uh, recently with the COVID uh, uh, period, where member states re-establish re uh, border checks, very often different border checks and the, all the different difficulties that this encounters for citizens, but also for economic actors and many, many companies around the, uh, Europe. We're still not as versatile, as mobile in the EU as in the US, but we're getting close. I mean, every day, 3.5 million uh, uh, people within the Schengen zone are actually crossing uh, borders, uh, invisible uh, borders. 1.7 million uh, workers do cross a border every day to actually go to their uh, workplace uh, and perform their economic uh, activity. And we've seen when re-establishing uh, borders, the economic impact, uh, uh, the economic loss uh, when borders are re-established because everything is slower, everything costs a lot more, uh, is evaluated at about 3 or 5 to 5% of uh, gross national income, which is very, very significant in these uh, uh, days. So. For 30 years, Schengen has been with us, and we're extremely pleased today to have this discussion to also explain to you some of the new features that we will want to have with, in order to improve even further the functioning of Schengen. 
Thank you so much, Olivia, for, for setting the scene and for this overview from uh, the Commission perspective. Let's now hear from our next speaker, uh, MEP Tanya Fayon. From your perspective, what do you think are the main challenges to improving the functioning of the Schengen area? And given these challenges, how do you see the future of Schengen? Is it bright? The floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me to this um, very timely debate um, on Schengen because uh, we seriously need to further improve Schengen. For me, I mean, coming from Slovenia, I do still remember um, how tangible it was for our country to join Schengen, this freedom of movement. I think this is one of the greatest achievement of our integration and symbolizes uh, for many citizens um, the importance of having the European Union. So um, it has brought down physical borders, but also borders in our minds. Um, and it's fundamental for the functioning of the EU. That is why I'm saying we, we have to improve it, because our Schengen today uh, is at crossroads, if I say so. It has been in deep crisis. After the 2015 migration flows, the terrorist attacks, internal border controls have been erupted and have been going on illegally for more than six years now in some of our Schengen member states. And Europe then also began closing itself off from the world by reinforcing its external borders. And then the COVID pandemic hit us. So at first the EU was in a chaos. Member states have stopped at the border medical equipment and cross-border workers. We have seen people dying in the Mediterranean. Now we are seeing people dying between our borders and instrumentalized like in Belarusian case or being violently pushed back like on the Western Balkan route. And Europe cannot stand silent with all of this. So Schengen, in a way, in the last few years going through this crisis, has become an scapegoat for every European problem and crisis and has become hostage for those. And seem not to be able to find a way back, how to completely restore it. You may still remember previous commissioners saying we shall restore Schengen, but so far we haven't been able to reform it. Um, so in the last year, when one crisis is still ongoing, another one erupts, we need to break this cycle once and for all. So today we are still in the situation that we are eagerly awaiting the reform of Schengen to be able to completely restore our interior borders that means to um, abolish the interior border controls. And with the new reform that the Commission is going to present early December, we need to address the challenges first for the last um, six years and the, those member states that are um, randomly having interior border controls um, against the legal grounds we have um, in Schengen area. And we have to equip the EU institutions with tools to be more effective and to act in unison when faced with such a challenge. Internal border controls cannot be the new normal. Thank you so much uh, for, for raising these very important points. It's, it's very important for us today to also have the perspective from the, the European Parliament, which creates a great uh, segue for our next speaker from the French permanent representation to the EU, uh, Pierre Vagnot de la Motte. Um, welcome once again. Um, so we all know that the French presidency of the council is coming up next. Uh, could you please walk us through the upcoming uh, French presidency's approach when it comes to the future of Schengen? Yes, good morning and thank you very much. Um, uh, I would say that uh, we consider the upcoming French presidency both as uh, an institutional and a political responsibility uh, on this issue as on the others. Uh, mentioning institutional responsibility, I mean France uh, uh, will be during six months uh, in service to the Council and in service to, to the Member States and then uh, will uh, behave as an impartial actor and this is a, a very important aspect of, of our work uh, for the upcoming month. When it comes to political responsibility, of course we will work and seek to make progress on the reform of, on, of Schengen uh, which we consider as a major issue. And I fully share what has been said by, by uh, Tania Fayon and by Olivier Onidi, uh, saying that uh, Schengen has been a major, one of the main achievements of the, the EU project in the, in the past years. In our view, uh, first, we need to strengthen our external borders. Uh, uh, we need to know uh, better, th better than today uh, who 
enters the EU territory and, and we need to be uh, um, more efficient on that aspect. And here uh, we need uh, both to implement some decisions we already made at EU level, as for example, uh, EU uh, information systems and databases, and also to adopt new rules on that aspect. As a second issue, uh, we need to enhance police cooperation and cross-border cooperation within the Schengen area uh, so that uh, freedom of movement can go hand in hand with security and safety for uh, European citizens. Uh, thirdly, we need to improve the Schengen evaluation mechanism, that is to say uh, a relevant process to assess whether the Schengen acquis is well implemented. And last but not least, uh, we are convinced uh, that there is a need for a stronger Schengen governance in the Council to ensure, uh, I would say, a relevant political and operational steering of the Schengen area. And that's a, a, a major element that uh, we, we look forward to, 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 uh, to pushing during our presidency. And on, on all of these issues, of course, we are expecting the upcoming proposals from the Commission with great interest. We are uh, looking forward to discussing them within the Council and then with the European Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pierre. Um, you completed our, our perspective and tour um, across the institutions. Um, if you may, please mute. Perfect. So now we avoid an echo. Um, thank you once again to, to the other speakers. As you recall, we asked the audience uh, to raise some questions ahead of the event. Uh, for our speakers today, which brings us now to um, the Q&A um, part. And perhaps the first question that we, um, that we identified can be addressed uh, to the uh, MEP, uh, Tania Fayon. We saw quite a few reactions from citizens on how the pandemic has temporarily affected free movement in the EU. And the audience felt this set a dangerous precedent, especially as many EU citizens perceive being European as very much enjoying the free movement within Schengen. From, from your point of view, how do you think this can be avoided in the future? Um, the COVID crisis was certainly a new lesson for all of us, and we had several discussions in the European Parliament. We need more safeguards. We need stricter and clearer rules when states can introduce controls, and we need to commission to act in case the law is breached. Just to give you an example, um, between 2006 and 2014, in almost nine years together, internal border checks were introduced only 35 times. But in the last six years, since 2015, so migration wave and then COVID pandemic, they have been introduced 295 times. So something is clearly wrong and all our alarms are ringing. So um, what I think is crucial it's to restore mutual trust between Schengen member states. Uh, while we didn't manage to reform Schengen in 2017, when the Commission gave the first proposal to restore Schengen, um, was actually um, the lack of mutual trust. And of course, uh, member states were abusing or for political purpose, reducing borders, even when that was not necessary. We adopted a resolution this year in July in the European Parliament on the annual report on the functioning of Schengen area. On one hand, we, of course, try to see the experience from COVID crisis. We try to identify the shortcomings and to get ready and be better prepared in similar crises, even when concerns health crisis in the future. So we are calling for a real and meaningful reform of the rules. We looked at extremely worrying situation at our external borders at the same time. While security, I perfectly agree, is very important, we must also remain human. We cannot tolerate violent treatment of migrants being instrumentalized for political purposes. We cannot allow for illegal pushbacks. We have to respect fundamental rights of all citizens at all times and everywhere. This was also a key message in that resolution coming from the European Parliament. So we are, as I said, eagerly awaiting what the new proposal on the reform, um, I think, will be uh, presented by the Commission on the 8th or 9th of December, uh, will bring. But what certainly will be our call, we have to fully restore Schengen, 
restore trust between Schengen member states and allow our citizens to freely move between um, our Schengen states. We have created in the last few years many new rules. We strengthen really strongly the external borders um, with purpose to restore Schengen and to be able to travel. It's also important for our free market. Just to tell you, we had some um, evaluation what would be the economic damage if we lose Schengen. There are different numbers, but some say even up to eight or seven billions per year. So this is a huge economic cost, not to mention political cost and how we would uh, weaken people to people's contacts. Thank you so much. Um, you gave us a, a comprehensive reply on the importance of freedom of movement again. Um, in the meantime, I invite the audience to follow up via the hashtag Ask Home if you have further comments or additional remarks on, on what the speakers are um, raising today. Um, and maybe I'll give an opportunity just quickly uh, to check before we jump to the next question if there's any additional remarks uh, from uh, perhaps uh, Pierre Renaud Lamotte um, before we go to uh, our Deputy Director General here. Um, if you have any remarks, feel free to unmute. No, that was very clear. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, and then perhaps uh, the next question for um, Olivia Onidi here. We received um, a couple of questions, whether there are any plans to discuss the accession of other countries to the Schengen area. The audience was particularly um, raising about Romania and Bulgaria. And furthermore, can delays like the ones these countries experience be avoided for other countries in the future? Thank you for, 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 for these questions. I mean, we, on Schengen, we have to work on uh, uh, the two aspects. The first aspect being uh, the one that uh, Tanya, Tanya Fayon has very well explained. We have to constantly improve uh, the functioning of this uh, uh, common. Uh, area uh, and uh, the, uh, the proposals that are meant uh, to be proposed uh, uh, in uh, the first uh, uh, week of uh, December will aim to actually correct a number of uh, aspects, improve a number of aspects, so that uh, uh, we uh, also uh, reinforce uh, the uh, a ex very existence of uh, uh, the Schengen area. The second aspect we have to continue uh, focusing on, of course, growing the Schengen area when uh, on the one hand side, member states uh, are willing to do so. Member states are willing to um, be member of uh, uh, the Schengen zone. And we have currently three uh, countries that are actively seeking uh, uh, to become a member of Schengen, Croatia, Bulgaria and uh, Romania. But also we need to be uh, sure that uh, those uh, uh, member states do qualify and uh, uh, have uh, the measures in place in order to become uh, a member of Schengen, first and foremost, to be able to implement all the measures that are expected from a Schengen uh, member state in terms of uh, protecting the external border. And second, also being able uh, to shoulder the efforts of other Schengen members in terms of cooperation, cooperation uh, with the, between the different uh, forces of uh, police, border guards, in order to um, make sure that criminals uh, are not uh, uh, misusing this uh, uh, common space. We have for uh, Croatia, Romania and Bulgaria completed uh, uh, quite uh, detailed evaluations. We believe, and the Commission has formally uh, proposed and uh, explained, that the conditions uh, in uh, our mind are met for these countries uh, to become members. Croatia and the membership of Croatia will be discussed by the ministry, ministers of interior at the next uh, uh, council uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, why? Because Croatia has, uh, uh, in the recent uh, years, uh, put in place uh, quite a second measure uh, and have gone through all the modernization aspects that uh, we expected uh, from them. The evaluation of Romania and Bulgaria dates already uh, nearly 10 years we, we proposed this. So here we will probably have uh, to uh, further uh, uh, assess uh, the latest and present the latest uh, uh, um, state of play in those two countries. But we believe that uh, with also the, the set of measures that we will be proposing in terms of improving the functioning of this uh, Schengen zone, uh, the confidence will be there 
for ministers to actually actively now work and embrace uh, the future enlargement of the Schengen area to these three countries. And then we will continue helping Cyprus in order to be also at one point in time ready to join. Thank you so much, Olivia. Um, maybe to check if there are any additional remarks on, on this question on the accession of the other countries. Um, yes, if I may, uh, Tanya here. <laughs> yeah, uh, because this is a very important point also. We need to enlarge Schengen area. It's certainly not fair that the Romania and Bulgaria are in the waiting room for almost nine years, which they fulfilled all the conditions. We have several times in the European Parliament called on um, enlargement of Schengen to both two countries. And we also need to enlarge it to Croatia. I'm glad to hear that in two weeks' time, um, as Olivia said, um, um, it will be discussed um, um, in the Council. Um, that there are certainly significant measures that the country adopted at the external borders. But I have to say at the same time that um, recently we had a discussion with Croatian officials and also representatives of NGOs and um, the civil society in our working group for scrutiny of Schengen about the um, reports of um, violent pushbacks of migrants on the border between Croatia and Bosnia. And Croatia acknowledged that was um, early October that its police officers had participated in those violent pushbacks that several European media outlets um, reported. The same goes also um, for Greek. So this is something that uh, we are still controlling and we have to put a strong emphasis on because um, it certainly we don't want to see any illegal acts on our future external uh, Schengen border. So um, this is something I just wanted to bring to our attention um, that we are also uh, discussing in the European Parliament and following the situation on our also European outside borders. Many thanks for, for your follow-up here. Uh, perhaps to check if the additional remarks from the uh, French Perm website. And if not, we actually the next question would be for them. So mm -hmm. um, we also a uh, question for uh, Pierre uh, Lamotte. We also have comments and questions regarding external borders, uh, traveling to Schengen from outside the EU. What can citizens expect from the French presidency when it comes to external border protection and its impact on, on traveling to Schengen? Yes, uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, uh, first, um, uh, we need to, to ensure that uh, uh, our, our management of uh, external borders uh, ensures the security of our common space. Uh, that's why we we need to um, uh, to implement the the tools that we uh, decided to. Uh, uh, on which we decided in, in the recent years, I mean uh, information systems, uh, uh, the ETIAS, uh, the entry exit system, the, the Schengen information system, and all of these tools are uh, some uh, some good uh, safeguard for our security. So uh, uh, we, we will be very willing to to, to ensure the follow-up of that uh, of these decisions and to to make sure that uh, we are uh, uh, we are meeting the the deadlines and the the, the, the timeline of uh, implementation so this is very much about implementation uh, of course uh, and also um, uh, we have on the table some uh, interesting uh, uh, legislative pro proposals from the from the Commission, such as the screening regulation uh, that we would like to 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 discuss uh, and on which we would like to to move forward uh, uh, in order to 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 ensure uh, relevant checks uh, at the external borders of, of the EU. So this is about uh, security. Uh, I think that a second aspect uh, has to do with, uh, I would say, uh, lessons learned from the from the pandemic and from the COVID crisis. Uh, we need to um, uh, to to provide uh, foreseeable rules for for uh, travelers, uh, for uh, people coming to the EU for. Uh, uh, professional job reasons, and, and we need to 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 have some uh, uh, very clear and uh, and uh, up to date criteria, and that's why uh, it is very relevant that we are uh, in these days uh, updating the recommendations uh, regarding uh, uh, access to the EU in the context of the COVID nineteen, 
and also that we maybe uh, uh, have more uh, clear uh, legislative rules on that aspect. So I would say to sum up, uh, enhancing security at the external borders and also uh, providing uh, foreseeable criteria for our travelers in order to uh, to 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 um, <laughs> allow for uh, uh, for uh, professional travels and and uh, uh, various uh, legitimate reasons for uh, for traveling into the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, you raised uh, some some very interesting points, and um, I'm sure that the the audience uh, will appreciate the overview. Uh, you also mentioned Etias, and actually we had a question specifically on Etias. So maybe now back to um, our deputy director general here. Uh, could you please explain briefly the the role of Etias, uh, just for for the audience to um, understand where again what what is it, and will this be in relation to to Schengen and and the protection of borders? Where do the two sit? All, all these new systems uh, uh, and the new architecture we're building uh, are, are meant to, to do two things. The first thing is uh, uh, to have a better appreciation uh, of uh, uh, the traveling public that is uh, uh, going to arrive at a Schengen border and, and then subsequently move uh, without restrictions like us in the uh, Schengen area. But they also meant to allow for seamless uh, border crossing, yeah? because we have seen over time with new procedures being established uh, worldwide that the traveling public very often encounters uh, uh, waiting time at borders, which we want to avoid. And uh, I think the ETIA system is a good example how to reconcile both. On the one hand, this system will allow us to pre-check uh, individuals who uh, are uh, willing to travel to the Schengen uh, area before they actually arrive at the borders. So uh, whenever there are questions about the eligibility of them uh, to actually travel and move within uh, the Schengen area, this can be sorted out, this can be checked before, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, in uh, uh, most of the cases, uh, there won't be absolutely any, any questions. And this only applies, of course, to those who are traveling to the Schengen without a visa, because when you are a visa holder, the visa procedure is meant to actually uh, check and uh, also get all the re relevant information about uh, a uh, traveler. Uh, but at the same time, in uh, uh, pre-checking uh, the availability of uh, an individual, this allows for simplified uh, procedures at the border when the person actually is standing in front of uh, the border guard um, and uh, will uh, be implemented in a very similar way as uh, certain uh, pre-authorization systems that we have seen uh, uh, developing, uh, for example, in North America, in the United States and uh, uh, in Canada. Thank you so much. Uh, we we now went through uh, almost all the questions that uh, that we gathered before the um, the event today. Uh, we still have a few minutes, uh, not many, but a few. So I'll give you the opportunity now. Um, addressing the public, if you want to ask a question, you can uh, raise your hand and, and and request that, or you may tweet uh, with the hashtag Ask Home. And um, we had um, somehow a follow up question that perhaps. Um, um, from the, the MEP, um, Tanya Fayon uh, may compliment because she was uh, speaking about also the, uh, the Western Balkans and uh, traveling uh, to Schengen, traveling to the EU. Is there anything that, um, that you would wish to further compliment on this or do you think that you addressed all the points? <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I believe the question maybe goes to um, still the ongoing process in the Western Balkans as regards the abolishment of visas for the citizens of Kosovo, if I so correct. And here I can see that, um, or I can say that um, it's um, the abolishment of visas for the citizens of the Western Balkans in general was also like um, Schengen for, for all of us, a most tangible achievement um, to be able to travel, of course, with a limited time. And Kosovo is a very unfortunate story because um, years ago, they also implemented all the conditions. The European Commission gave a green light, the European Parliament gave a green light. But unfortunately, in the EU Council, the member states didn't find yet a political agreement. And uh, this is why also people in Kosovo are losing faith. So we are pushing hard on the uh, EU governments to uh, make this a political decision, same as the other 
countries in the waiting room to enter Schengen, also for the abolishment of visas in Kosovo. What encourages me or gives me a big hope or optimism is the political change in Germany recently, because we have just seen um, the new coalition agreement, and Germany has committed itself to Europe like never before, but also to Schengen. So um, there will be some new uh, approach to Schengen. So um, also, uh, as regards Kosovo, I spoke with uh, different uh, diplomats, and I believe that there is the moment we need to seize it when it comes to restoring Schengen or reforming Schengen, rebuilding the trust, and also in the relation to our partners and friends in, in the Western Balkans. Thank you so much. Um, any other comments specifically on this from our speakers? All right. Um, I, I see here our uh, Deputy Director General would like to uh, add something, I think, maybe towards a bit of a, of a closing remark on, uh, on uh, the Schengen discussion. No, j just, just to, to, to note, uh, and, and that was very vivid in the, in the, in the debate we, we just had, uh, Schengen is, is alive and kicking. I mean, this is a, a central, it has really become a central feature of what the European Union is about for both citizens in, in their own rights, but also uh, in terms of uh, uh, our uh, economy. That was made very, very clear. Uh, we have challenges. Uh, Tanya was, uh, was, uh, was very uh, also explicit on uh, the numerous challenge, uh, challenges that uh, the Schengen zone uh, actually uh, navigated through, uh, still uh, deploying uh, all its potential, but hampered by a number of uh, events and also a tendency from member states to uh, sometimes uh, re-establish uh, borders or making a uh, border uh, trans transit uh, uh, more complicated than uh, it uh, it was in the in the past. So this, uh, of course, implies that we need to improve it. We need to improve the conditions for trust to be re-established amongst all member states, but also the tools for proper coordination, as uh, Tanya Fayon was describing. Uh, when faced with a situation like a pandemic, etc., making sure that uh, conditions uh, are uh, there for member states to actually take seamless decisions and not different decisions that uh, overly complicated uh, the, the life and uh, the travel of, uh, of our citizens. Very important as well is the fact that, and uh, Helmut Kohl, uh, a signatory, uh, German Chancellor, signatory of the Schengen uh, Agreement in 1990, said it very clearly. You cannot have a common space, like a common house, uh, actually, without two prerequisites. The first prerequisite is that you need to constantly improve the cooperation amongst law enforcement authorities, police, border guards. You need to establish common procedures. You need to have also joint uh, activities to jointly ensure the security of our common space. And the second condition is the fact that you also need a common migration uh, policy. Why? Because migrants, asylum seekers who arrive uh, uh, towards uh, the Schengen uh, area uh, are also meant to benefit of this common space. And, and this is something uh, extremely important uh, that uh, uh, needs to be repeated regularly it is only uh, in building further these two uh, angles that we will further nurture and improve uh, the overall functioning of the Schengen uh, area. Thank you so much. Uh, Tanya, yes, please Yes, uh, yeah, I would just like to add because Olivier was so um, good emphasizing and I have to say that here in the European Parliament we are working really um, um, very well with, with the Commission and with Olivier. We often fight on the same side of the table how to restore Schengen and it's good. Um, it's alive and kicking. I agree with that. But now we have really to kick our EU governments um, maybe to when the reform once is again on the table to find really this uh, political consensus or the confidence between the governments. Now, when we will improve um, the functioning of Schengen, I really wish to see that um, um, the rules will equally apply for all member states in Schengen, not when we see that there are maybe bigger member states such as France and Germany have a a different, um, you know, uh, um, a way out to um, not follow the, the legislation or some member, uh, other Schengen member states, what is the case now for the last six years. So also this Schengen evaluation mechanism has to have more teeth. The Commission and the Council also have to react much more swiftly in cases of serious deficiencies. So just maybe to wrap up, now when we are awaiting again for the reform of Schengen, 
Um, it's extremely crucial that we also deal with those member states that still have interior border controls, more transparent rules. We need more clear rules how long you can have um, interior border controls applied. We need also um, strong monitoring from the side of EU institutions um, and yes, and then um, to act if that is necessary. I am certain that all EU citizens um, really need to feel that integration is about freedom of movement. And as I said at the beginning, Schengen is really the most tangible uh, symbol of our integration. And uh, we have to raise awareness of that because today what is happening in the Schengen area is really um, um, very dangerous. Thank you so much for, for complimenting on, on this, Tanya. With all these points raised uh, earlier, there seems to be a lot on the plate of the French presidency coming up next, uh, a lot of work. Uh, I'm sure they're, they're very much looking forward to it. Yes, uh, thank you for your uh, encouragements. Uh, uh, I would not like to, 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 to speak too long, but uh, mm -hmm. I just want to say that uh, I fully share what uh, Olivier and Tanya said <laughs> about trust. Uh, trust being a very uh, a very important asset in the uh, in the Sh in the Schengen debate, uh, and that this is also why uh, I think that uh, uh, governance is important because uh, trust uh, goes with uh, discussions. Trust needs uh, talks and uh, a dialogue, and this is why uh, uh, having some. Uh, relevant uh, frameworks uh, to steer uh, Schengen, uh, both at the political and at the operational levels, uh, is second to none, uh, in our view. Thank you so much, Pierre. Yeah. We, we reach now the um, end of uh, today's discussion. Um, and one word that kept uh, appearing in, in all the points raised so far is the need for a more trusted Schengen. And I think that we can now perhaps associate more trust uh, with the direction towards the future of Schengen, uh, where we all want to head to. So thank you once again, everyone, uh, for joining us today. It was um, a real pleasure uh, here from uh, from DG Home. Um, we're hoping that the recording worked. If not, uh, we will still we, we recorded back up, so we'll um, find a way to share with you, especially for those who maybe joined it later and didn't have an opportunity to um, ask the question or hear everything. Um, I invite all our audience uh, to follow the accounts, the Twitter accounts of the speakers um, for uh, more updates and, uh, and their work on this field. And of course, uh, to uh, join our upcoming Twitter spaces, um, which, which we plan to um, organize uh, in the near future, as we've seen uh, our audience and um, more and more audiences is listening to and, and tuning in. So thank you so much once again, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's discussion. And we'll be in touch soon.